Oh, you're not going to read today? Are you sure? All right. Oh, hello everyone. Good morning. How are you today? This is day seven of our I Survived the Titanic. I Survived the Sinking of the Titanic. I never got that right. Read aloud. Um, but first I'm going to do my shout outs, okay? Um, so hello to all of you. Good morning. I know this is going to be another great day. I'm very happy to be with you. I wish I were there in person. So say hi to your moms and your dads and all the people taking care of you today too. So my shout outs are to LJ, JMT School, Jason, Bailey, Mrs. LeClaire's fourth grade readers, OMS Odessa Library, Mrs. Daigle's third graders, Mrs. Griffin's class, Mrs. Davis's fabulous fifth graders, Keegan, Henry and Clara, the readers at Falls Schools, Joanna Woodson Elementary third graders, Mrs. Hopkins fifth graders at BES, to Tessa and to Robert Kerr Elementary. And I'm also gonna give a shout out to my husband, David, who has been filming these read alouds for me every morning, bright and early. So you can all, you can all give him a shout out too. I'm sure he can hear you. So where were we? Oh my goodness. I left you at a very, a very um, harrowing moment for poor George. So he had the Titanic is sinking and there aren't enough light boats and um, Phoebe and, and Aunt Daisy and Enzo have made it onto a lifeboat and they thought George was gonna make it onto the lifeboat too. But George is a big, strong 10 year old and in the commotion, the, um, the Titanic crew won't let him on. They say women and children only and Daisy yelled, but he's only 10, but then the, the lifeboat was lowered, Phoebe tried to climb up, she got yanked back into the boat, they disappear, the, the ship started to sink, George fell, and when we left him, he had knocked, he, was, he had fallen and bumped his head and he didn't, everything sort of went dark. So that's where we left him at the end of chapter 12. So let's see what's gonna happen now. Whoops. So it's chapter 13. Strong arms lifted George up. He felt himself being carried. Papa, he said, Papa, why did his head hurt so much? Had the, pan had the panther knocked him out of the tree? Was he sick with a fever like mama? And whose voice was whispering in his ear? Giorgio, Giorgio, wake up. George opened his eyes. Marco's amber eyes shone down on him. This was no dream. He was not sick. The Titanic was sinking. The bow was completely underwater now and waves swept over the deck. Lounge chairs sailed past them and crashed over the side. People clung to rails. A few slipped and were swept overboard. Marco had wrapped one arm around the railing and the other around George. It's time to go, Marco said. Go where, George said, even though he knew. They were going into the water. There was nowhere else for them to go. Marco held George's arm as they climbed over the railing. When we jump, we jump as far out as you can, Marco said, away from the ship. George filled his lungs with the icy air. Jump, Marco cried. George pushed with his feet and leapt off the boat. He closed his eyes, imagining that he had enormous wings that would take him soaring into the sky. But what then he hit the water and down he went. And just when he was sure his lungs would pop, the ocean seemed to spit him back up. George sputtered. The water was so cold, it felt like millions of needles were stabbing him. It hurt so much, he couldn't move. Someone grabbed him by the life jacket and started dragging him up, dragging him away from the ship. It took George a few seconds to realize that it was Marco. He stopped to grab a door that was floating by. After helping George climb on top, Marco found a crate for himself. It wasn't big enough to keep his feet out of the water, but it was better than nothing. The crate had a rope attached to it. Marco tied it to his arm and handed the end to George. Hold tight, he said. They turned around and stared at the ship. The entire front was underwater and the back had risen toward the sky. It groaned and squeaked and sparked. Black smoke poured from its funnels and the lights flickered. It was like watching a fairy tale dragon, stabbed and bleeding, fighting for its life. And finally, it seemed to give up. The groaning stopped, the lights went dark, and the Titanic sank into the bubbling black water, down, 
down, down, until George closed his eyes. He couldn't make himself watch Mr. Andrew's beautiful ship disappear. A sound rose up around him, people calling for help, more and more people screaming and yelling, hundreds of voices swirling together like a howling wind. Marco pulled George away from the people in the wreckage. George couldn't believe how strong he was, how hard he kicked, how his arms sliced through the water. Here, this is a picture that Scott Dawson, the wonderful illustrator, drew for this. So you can see, try to picture what I'm reading. When he finally stopped, Marco was gasping for breath, exhaling cold, cloud, cold clouds of white mist. He tightened the rope around him and patted George on the shoulder. I rest now, Giorgio, he said breathlessly. He closed his eyes and put his head down in the crate. Soon. Soon what? George was afraid to ask. Soon it would be over? Soon they would be rescued? Or soon they would be swallowed up by the darkness? Men, George heard men talking somewhere close by. He looked around, relieved it wasn't, he wasn't all by himself. And to his shock, just ahead, he saw a lifeboat. Marco, he said, wake up. But Marco didn't move. His arms hung off the side of the crate. His feet dangled in the icy water. Marco, we need to get to that boat. But Marco was still, and George realized that his friend had used every ounce of strength. He'd gotten George off the sinking ship and across the icy waters. It was up to George now. He tucked the rope under his body and started paddling. The water seared his hands and arms. It was so cold it felt boiling hot, like lava. But he didn't stop until he reached the boat. And it wasn't a regular wooden lifeboat. It was much smaller and made of canvas cloth. There were about 10 people crowded inside, mostly men. They all seemed dazed and frozen. Nobody spoke as George paddled up and grabbed hold of the side. But somebody pushed his hand off. Get back, the voice said weakly. You'll put us all in the water. Please, George said, we need help. George put his hand up again, but again somebody pushed it off. And so George pulled Marco to the other side of the boat. He tried again. Nobody helped him, but this time nobody stopped him. It took him three tries, but he managed to hoist himself over the side and tumble into the boat. And now for Marco. He got up on his knees and leaned over, bracing his legs against the side of the boat as he grabbed Marco under his arms. He pulled, but Marco was attached to the crate by the, by the rope. He tried again, yanking the rope, digging at the knot with his frozen fingers, but the knot was like rusted metal. George struggled, and the water sloshed over the side of the boat. Just let him go, one of the men said weakly. It's hopeless. But George kept working on the rope, trying to break it away from the crate. He was pulling so hard at first, he didn't notice that Marco was slipping into the sea. Please, somebody, George screamed. Can't you help us? A woman from the front of the boat climbed back to George. She wore a black coat, her head and face hidden by a flowered shawl. As she, turned, as she pushed George aside, she pulled something out of her coat, a knife. With a clean cut, she sliced the rope and helped George pull Marco into the boat. Her hands looked surprisingly strong. George fell back exhausted. Thank you, George said to the woman through his chattering teeth. The woman didn't say anything and suddenly George noticed the knife, a Bowie knife with an elk horn handle. George looked up under the shawl. Two glittering blue eyes looked back at him. The scar-faced man, he had saved Marco's life. Without a word, he handed George his knife, then he looked away. So that Scarface man, he's a character who's kind of bad and good, right? So he was a thief, but he also sneaked onto a lifeboat by disguising himself as a woman. But then again, when no one else would help George, he was the one who risked himself to help get Marco onto that ship. So sometimes characters in books kind of seem bad, but there's some good in them. It's just sort of interesting to think about that. Chapter 14. The cold pressed down on George until it seemed to crush his bones. He huddled close to Marco, trying to keep them both warm. Marco barely moved. Some of the men sang softly. Others prayed. Some made, some, some made no sounds at all. Hours went by, the sea became rougher, and every few minutes a wave splashed into the boat. George was drifting off to sleep when one of the men shouted, It's a ship! 
and sure enough, a bright light was heading towards them. No, another man said, it's just lightning. But the, but the light was getting bigger and brighter. George stared at that light, afraid that if he blinked, it would disappear. But soon he could see the outline of a gigantic ship steaming towards them. He whispered to Marco, who barely fluttered at his eyes. He pulled his friend closer, rubbing his arms. It won't be long, he whispered, hang on. As the sky brightened, George gaped at the scene around him. It was as though they'd fallen through a hole in the ocean and come out on the other side of the earth. There were icebergs all around them, hundreds of them, as far as George could see. There's a picture. They sparkled in the golden pink light. They were so beautiful, but looking at them sent a, sent a chill up George's spine. As the ship got closer, George could see that it was a passenger steamer like the Titanic. Closer and closer it came until George could read its name, Carpathia, or is it Carpathia? I think you guys are gonna have to find that on, on yourself. I think you could look, up, look that up and let me know. Carpathia or Carpathia, but that's the name of the ship. There were people crowded on the deck, looking over the rails. They were yelling and shouting and waving, but one voice rose above all the others like a siren. Papa, Papa, Giorgio. Marco's eyes fluttered and he smiled a little. Enzo, he whispered. George could see the little boy waving frantically from Aunt Daisy's arms. Phoebe stood next to them, waving with the sunlight glinting off her spectacles. They're safe, George said, they made it. George grabbed Marco's hand. And so did we. So that's, that's, the, that's the end of this chapter. I still have a couple more chapters, which I'll read tomorrow, but I thought I'd give you just a couple things maybe to think about as um, between today and tomorrow. This is something I'm thinking about. So I, I would ask yourself, how has George changed from the beginning of the story to now? You know, in the beginning of the story, he was sort of a kid who got himself in trouble a lot of the time, and he was really, he's such a nice guy and has a wonderful heart, but maybe he didn't always make the best decisions. But now look at what George has done. You know, look what he did to help um, everyone, you know, his, his, his family get, get, off the, get out of the third class deck. He used his smarts and his know-how to get up those hidden ladders. Um, and now he helped Marco get across the icy water. So it's just something to think about whenever you're reading a book, a fiction book, characters they change from the beginning of the end and things that happen in the story kind of make them change so those are just things that you might want to think about um, stuff that I think about as a writer all the time when I'm creating my characters so I will say goodbye to you for now and um, I can't wait to be with you again tomorrow bye bye